Jacob is finally alone. He is on the side of the river, the opposite side of the river than his family and his flocks and his servants. He has traveled with his two wives, Leah and Rachel, from their father's territory. Their father Laban tricked Jacob into marrying both of his daughters. Jacob wanted to marry the younger sister, Rachel, but Laban made him work for him for seven years before that would ever take place. And then Laban gave Leah in marriage at that first ceremony, Rachel's older sister, claiming the oldest must marry first. And then, seven years after that, Jacob and Rachel finally married, and their sisterhood-long competition led to dozens of children among them, including the slaves that Jacob impregnated after they commanded him to do so. Jacob has sent symbols of his wealth and prosperity ahead of him to meet his brother, Esau. One could argue that Laban is almost fully responsible for all the success that Jacob has had, the reason why his flocks are so plentiful and his children are double the amount, because Jacob ran away from home right after he impersonated his brother Esau on his father's deathbed and stole his brother's birthright from him. But it was Esau who stayed and worked the land, caring for their aging parents, while his brother raised his own success in a foreign place, took wives and children and livestock. He is totally afraid of Esau, because the last he heard, Esau told other people that he would kill his brother the moment he saw him. At least that is what his mother, Rebecca, told him. So Jacob decides to test the waters a little bit. He sends a message to his brother that he is finally coming after all of these years, and he informs his brother Esau that he has been very successful, and he wants his brother's approval. So what does he do? Jacob sends these messengers, and then Esau responds by sending 400 of his men armed and ready for a fight in response. A show of strength and intimidation, a way to threaten and remind Jacob of his truly rightful place, that he is the second born, the grasper, the always unsatisfied, the always wanting more brother. And Esau will not stand for any attempt to charm or impress him. Jacob decides to send more symbols of his wealth rather than face Esau himself. Jacob has heard nothing since the messengers went out or the gifts were sent to Esau. He has no idea if Esau has killed them or welcomed them with open arms. He does not know what will happen to his wives and children when he sends them as a third symbol of his wealth and success, but he still does it anyway. He goes so far as to put a physical river between his brother's men and himself, sending everyone across the river, and then going back across the river by himself to spend a restless night above the stars. And then a faceless, nameless stranger wrestles him to the ground. Dr. Will Gaffney, Hebrew scholar, notes that there is a pun in this verse. The verb wrestle has the same letters as the word for dust. So the one who ends up covered in dust is the one who loses the wrestling match. That same verb also means to touch or plague or strike. We have no idea how gentle or rough this wrestler had been. Dr. Gaffney says it could have been a violent blow or a gentle touch. I'd like to read a section of a poem to you by Reverend Jan Richardson about this blessing. If this blessing were easy, anyone could claim it. As it is, I am here to tell you that it will take some work. This is the blessing that visits you in the struggling, in the wrestling, in the striving. This is the blessing that comes after you have left everything behind after you have stepped out, after
after you have crossed into that realm beyond every landmark you have known. Jacob's name means heel grabber. He was named because of his birth. Ironically, now his own heels are at risk because he struggles to remain steady on the ground. Jacob somehow knows that the person he is wrestling with matters and has the ability to bless him. And he wants it. He's wanted everything that he has ever had out of his reach in his life, and he will not stop until he gets it all, even a blessing from a stranger who fights with him. And the wrestler knows that Jacob does not give up easily, and the wrestler says, the sun is about to come up. Why are they so worried about the sun? What does it matter if the wrestler and Jacob see face to face? The wrestler commands that Jacob let him go before dawn breaks. Jacob has worked for everything he has earned, and he will not let go. He demands a blessing from the wrestler before they leave him alone in the dust. He somehow knows that the wrestler has more power than he does, and he knows if the wrestler could wound him, he could also bless him. The wrestler has the power to curse or to bless, to reveal or conceal themselves, and they finally ask Jacob, what is your name? Jacob does not name his ancestors, his parents, or his tribe. He does not place himself in the context of where he is from or who he belongs to. He simply says, I am Jacob the heel grabber. <laughs> he is so self-important, he does not even claim who he belongs to. He is so arrogant that he does not even remember who his father was or his mother was. The wrestler gives him a new name, calling him God Overcomer or God Wrestler, if you want to be playful. Jacob demands the name of the wrestler yet again, and the wrestler refuses to answer. Instead, they bless Jacob. But there is nothing written down about this blessing whatsoever. There is no way that we can hear the blessing ourselves like we do the blessing of Abraham and Sarah earlier in Genesis. And usually a blessing is spoken and then shared for generations to come. And you would think if your grandfather or father had wrestled with God, you would want to write that blessing down. But Jacob's blessing is only for him, for his ears and for that private moment on the side of the river where no one will see or hear. It is for no one else and no one will remember it after Jacob is gone. Maybe that was the whole point. Maybe the wrestling match itself was the blessing. Perhaps it was the rediscovery of his courage or the new name, the growth of Jacob from grabbing his brother's heel to attempting to even wrestle God to the ground to make sure he was successful and dominant. Jan Richardson continues, this is the blessing that takes all night to find. It's not that this blessing is so difficult, as if it were not filled with grace or with love that lives in every line. It's simply that it requires you to want it, to ask for it, to place yourself in its path. What is the point of this strange encounter? We are left with more questions than answers, which is typical for the Bible. This wrestling match ends in a new name and an unspoken blessing. We are left with more questions than answers at the end of this story. Like the shadows in the night that Jacob sees on the face of this person who comes to him, we also cannot know for certain who we are looking at or what we are looking to name as Jacob's assailant. We cannot know the wrestler's identity just as Jacob cannot see their face. And yet the text does give us a few hints. In verse 30, Jacob claims that he saw God face to face. 
During that transition from night to daybreak, as the shadows lessen and the light increases, their face became clearer to Jacob. It wasn't that this was a stranger. It was God all along appearing in the form of one, revealing themselves to Jacob in between the blessing and the parting, as Dr. Gaffney so eloquently puts. It demands that you stand to meet it when it arrives, that you stretch yourself in ways you didn't know you could move, that you agree to not give up. So when this blessing comes, born in the hands of the difficult angel who has chosen you, do not let go. Give yourself into its grip. It will wound you, but I tell you, there will come a day when what felt to you like limping was something more like dancing as you moved into the cadence of your new and blessed name. I must ask today of us what we are struggling to endure in this moment in our lives. What are we trying to hide behind, like Jacob? Is it our family? Is it our professional success? Is it our social status, our wealth, our ideals? Whatever it might be for you, I want you to know that God sees us underneath all of those trappings. Just like God saw Jacob alone underneath all of his prosperity. When we are alone and nothing is left but ourselves, God meets us there. God meets us as we strive, as we insist that we must work for everything in our lives, as we insist that nothing comes easily, as we live into our identities and tell everyone, perhaps even God, this is just who I am. This is who I always will be. But is that really true? Do we really need to work that hard? Do we really need to strive so much? What are we trying to prove to everyone anyway? What are we trying to prove to ourselves? God wants to bless us. We must stop fighting the blessing or forcing the blessing to come early or control what that blessing looks like. We must trust that God has blessings for us no matter how long we must wait, no matter how different the blessings look than we expected them to. We must embrace the blessing of finding ourselves alone in the dust. The blessing that comes when we finally lay down on that sweet earth accepting the name that God has given to each of us, the God who transforms us forever. Amen.